I should also Yeah, Chaitanya, over to you, Nandana. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the second day of the series of two invited talks titled Unraveling Notes, Four Perspectives, which is being delivered by Dr. Abhijit Champanekar from the City University of New York. Today's talk will be in continuation of yesterday's talk. Today we have Dr. A. V. Jayanthan as the chair of this session. Dr. A. V. Jayanthan is currently a professor in the Department of Mathematics at IIT Madras. Dr. Jayanthan earned his PhD in Mathematics from IIT Bombay and Master of Science from the University of Mumbai. His areas of research interest include theory of Hilbert functions, polynomials and coefficients and their connections with properties of blow-up algebras and combinatorial commutative algebra, interaction between the combinatorial invariants of a graph with the algebraic invariants of the corresponding monomial or binomial edge ideas. Dr. Jayanthan has been associated with MDTS for a very long time. We are very happy to have him as the chair of today's session. I would now hand over the session to J uh, Dr. Jayanthan. Jayanthan, sir, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Chaitanya and Nandana. Uh, <clears throat> so welcome back uh, uh, to today's session. Uh, so uh, most of you were probably here yesterday, but I would uh, uh, again, I mean, Ajit gave a, a pretty a uh, good introduction uh, introduction of the speaker abhijit uh, yesterday but i will quickly do that just for uh, you know those who uh, were not here uh, so abhijit uh, completed his msc from uh, mumbai university uh, and then subsequently joined the columbia university for phd uh, after completing his PhD from Columbia. He was uh, uh, a postdoc in uh, uh, Columbia and also uh, a faculty at uh, University of South Alabama. Um, and then he joined uh, uh, CUNY. Uh, so, <clears throat> and he has been there uh, ever since. Uh, his uh, area of research is uh, not theory uh, and related subjects. Uh, so I uh, welcome Abhijit uh, and uh, hand over the stage to him. Thank you very much, Jayanthan, and thank you very much, uh, Chaitanya uh, and uh, Nandana. And thank you to the Curry Leaf team for organizing this event uh, so flawlessly. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's really a great forum uh, for math talks and math interaction. So this is the second talk. Uh, yesterday we saw uh, knots, how some of the origins of knot theory and how diagrams are very important in knot theory. Some of the diagrammatic invariants like crossing number, not colorings. Uh, we also saw Jones polynomial and how the Jones polynomial resolved a, a very deep and old conjecture uh, of Tate. So today we are going to uh, change some tracks and uh, go to the other perspectives, that of topology and geometry. So here we are. So as I said, today's talk will involve topology. 
of not complements the Alexander polynomial, which was the first sort of sophisticated gadget to uh, study knot theory using topology. The ciphered surfaces, then hyperbolic geometry of knot complements, and generalizations and open problems. So the outline of today's talk, as I said, uh, is like this. We'll spend a little bit of time introducing hyperbolic geometry and see how, how that came up and some of the origins of uh, hyperbolic geometry. So topology is the study of position. The Greek word uh, uh, made up of the Greek word topos, which is position and logi is study. Uh, so it, it uh, studies properties of objects uh, which, are, uh, which are preserved under continuous transformations. So you cannot tear the uh, objects, you cannot cut objects. For example, if you just take a piece of string, then you can deform it, uh, but you cannot uh, glue it together or you cannot make more pieces out of it. So, but not tearing and gluing together. So for those reasons, it is known as rubber sheet geometry because you're allowed to stretch. So in particular, uh, the, the classical interest of geometry, which is measurement, length and area, uh, those are not really relevant in topology because if you stretch something, the length will change. So here is a very nice illustration of how the topology works. Uh, the, this is of a coffee mug kind of being deformed into a donut. So it is, the joke is that a topologist cannot tell a coffee mug uh, from his uh, donut or from his medu vada. So that's, this, is a, this is a nice sculpture by uh, mathematician and artist Henry Siegerman. The origins of uh, topology uh, begin with Euler in his uh, very famous solutions to the problem of seven bridges of Conisberg. And it's uh, regarded as a fundamental paper because at the same time, he started two fields. He started topology and graph theory. So it's a very, very nice history uh, of, of, this, of this problem and how Euler solved it using effectively what is known as Euler in circuits. Uh, another of Euler's discovery, which is a very famous Euler's polyhedral formula, V minus E plus F is equal to two, is really uh, the, uh, at heart a topological invariant. Uh, it says something about the sphere that you can represent it using some kind of vertices, faces, uh, and edges. And no matter uh, how you do that, a quantity of V minus E plus F is always remains invariant. It is something which is which does not change if you if you change the description of it. So this is an example of a topological invariant, which now is of course known as the Euler characteristic. Talking of Euler characteristic uh, surfaces, i.e. two-dimensional manifolds, uh, there's a very nice uh, classification of surfaces. Here we are just going to uh, see the orientable one, but there is one for non-orientable surfaces. So these, you can just list them. This is the sphere, the torus, and then the genus G surfaces. So meaning that you are, you are taking a connect sum with the torus with itself. So you can see right over here how you can take a connect sum. like this. So this is a connect sum of two tori, this is the connect sum of three tori and so on. Like so. And uh, there's a similar classification for non-orientable surfaces starting with the projective plane and connect sum of projective planes. So connect some of two projective planes, for example, is the Klein bottle. So the genus is an important topological invariant of the of surfaces. Torus has genus one, it counts the number of holes in surfaces. There is one more thing which we'll need later, which is surfaces with boundary. And those are exactly similar, except you just puncture open disks. So for example, a, a surface with some boundary components will look something like this and with some genus in there. So this is a surface with boundary. So now let's move to uh, knots and to do topology on the knots, 
at the topological point of view, we start with the not complement, which is uh, the uh, which is S3, the three sphere minus the interior of a regular neighborhood. Now we saw last time that a regular neighborhood of a knot is a union of solid tori. I should just remind uh, everybody that when I say a knot, I mean a knot or a link, meaning that uh, a, a, a smooth embedding of either S1 or a smooth embedding of a disjoint copies of KS1s in uh, the three sphere S3. So uh, since we are removing a regular neighborhood, which is a solid torus uh, and the interior of it, the boundary of this resulting manifold uh, consists of a union of tori, and this is a compact manifold. And now we immediately get not invariants because uh, if you if you take um, if you take a uh, if 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 you take an invariant of the topological space. Um, then uh, you, since knots were defined as equivalence is defined using some kind of homeomorphism on the on on the three space, taking one one to the other, uh, the complements are also homeomorphic, and so uh, any topological invariant of the complement uh, now becomes an invariant of the knot. So it's very important uh, since we are looking at knot invariants. So one of the first invariant of a topological space, which you study in any course on algebraic topology, uh, would be the fundamental group. So this is pi one uh, is the fundamental group of the knot complement. We'll we'll denote it as the knot group. Okay, we'll we'll call it the knot group and denote it as just pi one of k. It does not mean pi one of uh, the uh, the S1, the circle, it actually means the pi one of the knot complement. Usually, I, I sometimes I would also denote the knot complement as just S3 minus K. So this is a theorem by Werdinger. It gives a presentation. So if you have a knot diagram with n crossings and you have some strands like we saw, uh, something which goes from one undercrossing to the other undercrossing, then uh, the generators of this knot uh, of this knot group corresponds corresponds to loops which are uh, which are around the strands so if you if you think of if you think of a knot like this then You're looking at loops at every, every along every strand like that, uh, but for fundamental group reasons, uh, you can imagine like a point over here, and these loops kind of uh, have uh, go to a base point, something like that. So these are your x1, x2, x3, and they are just indicated in the plane uh, just by uh, just by this arc over here. So you can see the over strand. Uh, the loop is the same loop, and then the understrand, since they're broken, uh, they have different loops which are representing them. So as usual, we, are, uh, we have to be a little careful about what kind of crossing we use. Uh, so this is going to be a positive crossing. So this is a positive crossing, and this is a negative crossing, right? The over strand with the arrow to the understrand is right-handed here, and this is left-handed. So, uh, and and in particular, ah, there's the relation, and that's the relation which we use. So the relation, what is this doing? If you look at the, uh, this loop going like this, and you imagine this this uh, uh, base point over here, then uh, when you compose these loops, you are actually getting something like this. Right, and now you are just swinging this uh, over to the other part, and then that the other part is uh, the, given by the loops x k multiplying by x uh, x i. So that's exactly what the relation is. So this is just swinging around like that, right? It it goes under the under the whole crossing. It's just swinging under the crossing like that, and the same thing is happening over here. Um, and so the, the relations look a little different for a positive and negative crossing. But the important thing to note that what is it really saying? It's saying that if you have this xi plus one or xi, 
uh, as it passes under a, a, a strand, it gets conjugated. This is just getting conjugation, right? This is just getting conjugation by XK inverse XI plus one and XK. And of course that is for the negative, the negative leads here for the positive one, it's just going to be XI equal to XK, XI plus one XK inverse. So that's what the difference between the positive and negative crossing is. So it's a very simple relation. It is just going to be conjugation. So every relation is just conjugating the generators. And here's an example. We have the favorite figure eight knot. And uh, here are the strands. As we saw, there are four, there are, there are um, four strands. And here are the four generators. Uh, for each strand and now for the for the four crossings uh, there are there are four relations but uh, it's a it's a easy uh, exercise to show that you can always ignore one of the crossings because of planarity the last crossing the relation at the last crossing follows from the relations for the other cro other crossings and uh, we don't have to keep the group in this form you can actually uh, simplify the relations and actually this group simplifies to uh, a group with uh, two generators and one relation as opposed to our initial group had uh, n generators and n relations so so four generators and four relations but now this simplifies so very non-trivial fact is uh, that uh, if K is the unknot, if and only if it's, fun, it's not group is infinite cyclic, which is Z. Uh, this follows from uh, a, a theorem by Dan and Papa Kaira Coppolas. It has a very interesting history. It's essentially uh, starts with the lemma of Dan, called, uh, used to be called Dan's lemma. Uh, who proved it around maybe 1920s, but then people found an error in it, but it was a very critical lemma. What it said was uh, effectively it said that if you have some loop in a three manifold uh, in which, which in hom uh, a simple closed curve in a three manifold, which is trivial in uh, the fundamental group, then there is an embedded disk uh, which it bounds. So that really simplifies a, a lot of things. Uh, but then Papakairakopoulos uh, fixed the error and actually gave a different proof of Dan's lemma. And then he proved some other theorems for, you know, to, for the sphere and so on. And uh, one of the nice consequences of that is that the fundamental group determines the unknot. Uh, what is the unknot here? Uh, unknot, uh, you can see that uh, the, the group of the unknot is actually Z because this is the crossingless circle. Uh, and if K is the unknot, then the complement of this is just going to be the solid torus. And the solid torus has the homotopy type of S1. Okay, so the fundamental group of S1 is Z. So uh, you can figure out, uh, it's a good exercise to figure out the homotopy type of unlink on N components. What is the unlink on N components? It just looks like this. So this is, this is, this is N components. So now we come to uh, the first sort of sophisticated invariance, which does not involve not diagrams, but involves topology. So it starts with the observation uh, that the, the homology group of the not complement is Z. Now, let me just go back and, and quickly show you why, why that is so. Uh, the, the, the homology group is, the abelianization of the knot group, right? The, the homology group uh, of any topological space is the abelianization of the fundamental group. Abelianization is, you, you are just making it commutative. Now, notice that uh, these uh, are all meridional generators. Abhijit? Yes. Uh, Buddha Dev has raised his hand. Yes, yes, I, I have a question actually. So, yes, please. Question is, uh, question is, uh, Every knot has a what in a representation for every yes, knot. Yes, yes, okay. yes. 
you just start with the diagram of the knot and we have seen that every smooth knot has a diagram and from the diagram you can construct the representation of uh, the 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 group presentation yeah okay okay our next question is uh, if uh, we are taking uh, suppose we are taking any alternating knot so yes. is there any universal presentation of wattinger representation for all alternating knot uh, no, the the Wertinger presentation is pretty universal. It is just giving you a a, a a a relation which is a conjugation at every crossing. Uh, okay. it, you, you, what what you're asking is that is the fundamental group somehow special for alternating? Special for uh, for not, alternating. And, and that is actually not known. That is a very good question, and okay. uh, it, it it is in some sense, but not really using any kind of group theory as such. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sir. It's, Thank it's you. Special slightly in a different way, but that involves other other objects. Okay. Uh, so, so when we abelianize it, notice that here there's a conjugation at every crossing. So when you take a conjugation and abelianize a conjugation, when you abelianize it, you just get uh, like this, right? So your x3 cancels and you get x1 is equal to x2. So all of these generators after you abelianize become the same generator. So what happens is that uh, you are getting the homology group to be Z, right? So uh, what does covering space theory tell us? If you look at the commutator subgroup, your H1 is G quotiented by the commutator subgroup. That means that there is a covering space which corresponds to this cover, which which corresponds to the commutator subgroup, and the deck transformation group of this is Z. So uh, the, the fundamental group of the covering space is commutator subgroup, but the deck transformations correspond to Z. What does that give us? That means that uh, the the so you can you can check that this action descends down to an action on the homology of this infinite cyclic cover. This k infinity is called uh, the infinite cyclic cover. of k and this is now becomes a module over uh, the ring of Laurent polynomials in one variable well what is this this is just the group ring of z okay so uh, this is some standard uh, uh, algebra if you have an action on some some group then you can make it into a module or the group ring so this is just the group ring of z and this is induced by the action of this H1 of K on K infinity, deck transformations. This is called the Alexander module. Now, once you have a module, like a like a abelian group or Z, you have a presentation, right? You can write down a presentation matrix which incorporates the generators and the relation. And so a presentation matrix uh, for this module, the Alexander module is called the Alexander matrix. And now you look at one particular ideal uh, in this ring of Laurent polynomials, which is generated by uh, all the R cross R minors. And that is called the Alexander ideal. And this ideal uh, is does not depend on your presentation matrix. So you can change the presentation matrix, but you will get the same ideal. And what Alexander proved that uh, the Alexander ideal is always non-zero and always principal ideal. What does principal ideal mean? It's generated by only one polynomial and the generator is called the Alexander polynomial. Uh, so the way it is defined uh, exactly from the topology of the knot complement, it's automatically not invariant. And it's also note that it is well defined. Uh, uh, it's defined up to multiplication by units. Up to units. So you can IE uh, T to the power K. So, uh, okay, that's really great. Well, how do I compute it? How do we work with not comp knots? We have a diagram, so how do we compute it from a diagram? Now, we know that Wertinger has solved this problem, part of it, because we are given a diagram, we can now get a 
uh, presentation for the fundamental group. So maybe we can work with that presentation. Now what happened was there are actually uh, many different ways of computing the Alexander polynomial. It is so well studied uh, roughly about 100 years ago. So it is so well studied. Um, so the first uh, approach to the Alexander polynomial was given by Seifert uh, very very shortly after the uh, after the definition of the Alexander polynomial using Seifert surfaces and Seifert matrices. And Seifert's approach was so powerful that it solved many big questions about the Alexander polynomial. In particular, if the Alexander polynomial is trivial, uh, is is it is the knot uh, the trivial knot? Meaning, does the Alexander polynomial determine the unknot? And the answer is, is that no. You can construct many knots with trivial Alexander polynomial. Note that even after roughly 40 years, uh, the the question on about Jones polynomial, whether Jones polynomial determines the unknot, is still not unsolved. We saw this in the previous talk, in the talk yesterday. Uh, then, then Ralph Fox came up with uh, his idea of Fox calculus and Fox derivatives for groups um, in about 1953. And then, um, then uh, Conway, John Conway, the famous mathematician, uh, he gave a skein relation and gave a very combinatorial approach in 1969. And Kaufman, who, whom we uh, talked about yesterday, the Kaufman bracket, he also gave a state uh, model for the Alexander polynomial, uh, which kind of involved spanning trees, uh, which we saw yesterday. So spanning trees of the Tate graph, and you get a state model for Alexander polynomial. So um, let's actually see uh, one approach uh, today, which is ciphered surfaces, which is a very, important idea uh, in in knots because it is used for many many things and also very topological so um, if you remember your multivariable calculus if you take a if you take um, a, a closed uh, simple closed curve or so you take a simple closed curve in r3 and you are proving one of the theorems i think it's the fundamental theorem of line integrals Is that, yeah, or, or using the, no, no, not, not that. If you want to use the, if you want to prove the Stokes theorem, you need to start with the surface which bounds this, uh, this uh, uh, an orientable surface which bounds this knot. So uh, uh, that's precisely what a ciphered surface is. It's an orientable surface with boundary, uh, which uh, whose boundary is exactly the knots. It's an orientable surface in uh, R3 or in S3. Uh, so, uh, Seifert gave a construction for this, uh, given any knot diagram. So here is here is the trefoil knot. We have these two different sort of diagrams for the trefoil, and there's an obvious surface which bounds. Uh, you can see uh, there is a twist at, at every crossing here. And the question is, of course, which of the above is not a ciphered surface? So note that they have to be orientable to be ciphered surfaces. We don't want to non-orientable surfaces. So what is Seifert's construction? Um, you start with a knot diagram and choose an orientation. And then there is a unique way to smooth every crossing so that it preserves the orientation, right? So if you, if you have an orientation like this, uh, you can only resolve it just so that the orientation is preserved. The other resolution will give you, uh, uh, th that's a problem, right? So this is not allowed. And so you do that, and now you get a bunch of oriented circles in the plane. Now what you do is anytime a circle loops, you kind of lift it a little bit up, up from the surface like so. And now you cap every, every uh, uh, circle with a disc like this. But then, of course, if the circles are nested, you just lift them up a little bit from the plane. And now you um, you attach the circles, uh, attach this this to each other using twisted bands, right? A twisted band is just uh, something like this. That's a twisted band. But you you attach it with a twisted band, which corresponds to your crossing, like that. And it is an orientable surface because every circle, every disk which you have is orientable. So, so what does it mean to be orientable? That means that you have a positive direction and a negative direction like so. And since everything is orientable, when you're going along the twisted bands, there you can see the positive, the, the, the positive side and the negative side here. 
so as you go along the twisting you have to go underneath the crossing and then again come out so the the by construction uh, this surface is orientable by construction because you are starting with uh, with oriented circles so once we have uh, surfaces which are bounding knots what we can define is the genus of a knot so a genus of a knot this is not a closed surface so uh, a genus of a surface with boundary is the genus of the closed surface obtained by capping of the boundary components. So, for example, if you have uh, something like this, then when you cap it off, you get a torus. So, this genus is one, the genus one. So, it's very simple. So, the genus of a knot is the least genus of any ciphered surface for the knot. And uh, there are very interesting consequences. The genus determines the unknot because if your genus is zero, uh, then there is only one way to cap it off. So uh, if you cap off and you get get zero, then any any closed curve on S two uh, will bound a bound a disk. And so that that knot bounds a disk, which means that it is the unknot. Uh, the genus uh, of uh, the trefoil here we have seen here you can you can check that this genus is actually genus one uh, and the genus of the figure eight knot is also one and genus is additive under connect sum of knots so this is a proof that it is additive under connect sum uh, what this is doing is this kind of construction shows that uh, the connect sum is actually uh, 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 is greater than or equal to this connect sum. But then to get the other inequality, it requires a little bit of work. Okay, so um, yeah, I think what can we do with so Yes. Buddhadev? Uh, I think he has no, not lowered his hand. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Right, so um, what do we do with the ciphered surface and how does it come to the Alexander polynomial? How can we compute Alexander polynomial? So for that, we need to construct a ciphered matrix. So this is really a beautiful idea of ciphered is that once you have a surface in, uh, in, in R3, an orientable surface in R3, uh, you can get a, bi a, 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 a form on the homology of it. So the idea is using the linking number. So what is the idea? Uh, you thicken the surface uh, like so, and now you have a, pos a, a copy S plus, which is uh, lying at, uh, so, so thickened surface will look something like this. And now you have a copy at the, at the level plus one and a copy at a level negative one. And so that's S plus and S minus. And so any oriented loop which you have on the knot, uh, on the surface, will have a push off. So there is a loop which lies on S plus and loop which lies on S minus. And now you kind of you kind of take the linking number uh, with the push off with with the loop. So link. So you take any loop gamma and you look at the linking number of gamma with gamma plus or with gamma minus. Doesn't matter. Uh, how do we compute the linking number of two loops? It is exactly how we computed uh, uh, last time. You have oriented loops and you have a positive crossing which counts for plus one. And if you have a negative crossing, uh, then it counts for uh, negative one. So this is a positive crossing, positive orientation, negative orientation. So, uh, and you just add up or all the crossings. So that's, that's the linking number. And now we get a ciphered pairing or a linking form on the homology of surfaces exactly by you take a generating loop and you look at the linking number uh, with all the other generators. So th this is the this is a standard generator for uh, for a surface with boundaries. So standard generators for surface with boundary. 
I should just add that any surface with boundary looks like this, except that uh, these these bands may be twisted. Okay, so they, it, it, this doesn't show twisted bands here, but the bands may be twisted also. So you can you can show that the 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 fundamental group, which is going to be a free group for a for a surface with boundary and it's generated by these loops so now you take e each of these loops take a push off and take the linking number with itself um, not with itself with all the other loops and that's where you will get the uh, ciphered pairing so what happens when you have a pairing M mind you what is the what is the homology of the group uh, this is just uh, sorry the homology of the surface this is just going to be z uh, it's a it's going to be z to some power right z to uh, some some power m so uh, now we have uh, if a, a a form uh, a bilinear form and so now we can write down the matrix of this bilinear form so that matrix is called the ciphered matrix so you can actually compute this very explicitly uh, here is a here is the trefoil knot orientation here is the ciphered surface for it these are what the what the generating loops are and now you kind of take a push off of it and you try to compute so so l l here it will the way it will look like so you have something like alpha and you take a push off of it so alpha plus uh, or alpha one plus will look something like this but then as it goes under notice that it will it will fl flip here right so it will go like this it goes under and then when it when it comes up again it will it will uh, cross over but in the other direction like so so now you can you can compute what the what the what the uh, linking number is i think the linking yeah uh, maybe you have to divide by 2 uh, when you add up all the crossings so you get the you get this matrix an integer matrix and that's a ciphered matrix. And once we have a ciphered matrix, now we can do many, many things. So the first uh, invariant is the, called the determinant. It's the determinant because it's the determinant of the symmetrized ciphered matrix. So you just add uh, you add it with the transpose to make it a symmetric matrix. And then you get the signature of uh, of the same uh, symmetrized ciphered matrix, and that gives you the signature of the knot. And most importantly, the Alexander polynomial is now defined exactly like this. You just take t times m minus uh, the the transpose, and you take the determinant of this. This gives you one variable polynomial, and that is Seifert's construction of the Alexander polynomial. So. Um, uh, so using Seifert's techniques, we can find uh, non-trivial knots with trivial Alexander polynomial. So the unknot detection problem, it does not detect the unknot. Knots with prescribed Alexander polynomial with some properties, the polynomial has to have some properties which correspond to Alexander polynomial properties. And that is the realization problem. And then you can relate the Alexander polynomial span of Alexander polynomial to the knot genus. So really incredible work uh, right away after Alexander, he solved many, many questions which, which naturally arise after you define a new invariant and you can draw beautiful pictures and even construct you can construct a crochet of uh, ciphered surfaces you can construct 3d models you can do uh, metal sculptures and of course draw wonderful pictures uh, using uh, 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 of ciphered surfaces these visualizations are by Vic and Cohen um, okay that was uh, some invariants are in a topological perspective on knots or rather not complements so we are now going to go into geometry so before that any questions uh, okay hands raised so, so uh, before we go into the geometry of not complements let me just give you a very quick uh, motivation behind hyperbolic geometry so we all know euclidean geometry and euclid is known as the father of geometry he wrote the famous book the elements so famous that it was actually the is known to be the most successful book 
um, uh, uh, text, influential textbook after uh, ever written, and only more of, uh, as popular next to the Bible. So uh, at at some point when our printing started. It was one of the first books to be printed after the printing technology came out, uh, of course, after the Bible. And so uh, it, it gives, uh, it, it constructs our the geometry, which we all learned in school, uh, based on these five postulates, right? You can draw a straight line between any two points. You can, um, uh, every straight line can be continuously extended to an infinite line. Um, we have a circle with a center and radius and that the right angles so these four postulates are good. The fifth postulate, uh, uh, I'm giving you the Playfair's version, given a line and a plane, uh, sorry, in a plane, given a line and a point outside it, you can construct a unique uh, straight line uh, passing through this point. And that is the Playfair's version. Euclid's version is slightly different. Um, so, well, nice, but the four postulates look so nice and the fifth looks a little odd. So there was a lot of activity, a lot of effort to prove the first, fifth postulate or the, or the parallel postulate using the first four postulates. And many, many, many people tried this. Very famous mathematicians all throughout the ages, Ptolemy, Proclus, Omar Khayyam, Sacheri. Uh, but they 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 could not do this. So then, by the after two thousand years of trying, about nineteenth century, it was believed that this problem could not be solved. Finally, it was settled in the negative that you cannot get the Euclid's uh, fifth postulate from the first four with the discovery of what now we call non-Euclidean geometry. So. Um, uh, either Riemannian geometry uh, for Riemann or uh, hyperbolic geometry and spherical geometry, uh, hyperbolic geometry of Lobachevsky and Bolyai. So there's really wonderful history and Gauss also seems to have discovered it uh, but did not publish because uh, he thought it won't be a very popular point of view. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's how hyperbolic geometry was discovered. So what is the uh, idea what happens if the parallel postulate isn't true that means that parallel lines don't have to uh, go uh, uh, along with each other like in Euclidean space the distance between them stays the same but then in in the in the non-Euclidean space the distance can either uh, reduce which will give you spherical geometry or it will increase which will give you they go away from each other which will give you hyperbolic geometry so uh, uh, an example of this is the pseudosphere which is uh, which is the surface of uh, revolution of a certain um, a cu curve called the tractrix. And uh, you can see that there are parallel lines here which are really not intersecting. Uh, and, and to one line, there are infinitely many parallel lines and they kind of go away from each other. So that's hyperbolic uh, uh, geometry. And now they started giving models of hyperbolic planes. So meaning that you give a set of points, you give a set of lines, you give the distance formula, and then you do all the geometry, the measurements, the lengths, the areas, and etc. So you can do all of the geometry. Uh, so this is an example of the upper half plane, uh, which is uh, 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 x t with t greater than zero. And straight lines here, are, uh, are lines which are, which are perpendicular to the x-axis or circles which are perpendicular to the x-axis, like so, right? And you can see that now if you take a line and if you take a point uh, outside the line, you can see that there are infinitely many lines which pass through this, parallel lines which pass through this. So you have actually infinitely many circles like this. And so on. So it clearly does not uh, uh, satisfy the parallel postulate, but it satisfies all the four postulates. So by construction, uh, this is uh, this is not Euclidean, and so Euclid's fifth postulate does not follow from the first four. There are other models of the hyperbolic plane. This is the hyperboloid model. Uh, uh, there's a Poincaré disk model. There's a Beltramic line model. So there are it's a, it's a very very nice. Uh, uh, this geometry to do hyperbolic geometry, many things uh, happen like uh, in Euclidean geometry and many things happen unlike in Euclidean geometry. 
there is also uh, a lot of art around uh, uh, hyperbolic geometry. What happens is that uh, if you look at the distance function, uh, the distance uh, in, in here, as you approach the x-axis, the distance starts uh, increasing between two points. So for example, uh, if you look at the distance here, uh, as you as you go to infinity, this hyperbolic distance, although it looks the same Euclidean distance, the hyperbolic distance will go on decreasing. Whereas if you if you go down to the x-axis, the hyperbolic distance will go on going to zero. So sorry, as you go to infinity, yeah, the, sorry. If you go to infinity, the distance starts going to zero. As you go to x-axis, the distance starts going to infinity. Exactly like this. And um, and so that gives some very nice art. Escher has used the hyperbolic plane in some of his work. This is a crochet by uh, uh, by uh, Taimina, which kind of mimics how the hyperbolic plane kind of will have negative curvature. And it is just taking a crochet by by uh, increasing the number of uh, knots which you do uh, around each circle. So if you just do a, a linear number, you will just get a flat thing. But if you increase the number of uh, things around, around, you will get this sort of curling. It looks something like a kale, uh, which is a leafy vegetable here. And uh, it, this all fits in with the three basic plane geometries. There is the Euclidean geometry, there is the uh, uh, spherical geometry or elliptic geometry, and then there's the hyperbolic geometry. And there are similar geometries in the higher dimensions. So you can see, for example, here, all triangles, uh, uh, the sum of angles is uh, pi, the sum of angles here is greater than pi, sum of angles is less than pi. And so many, many things are different, but there are many similar things also. And if you go back to surfaces, well, uh, you can actually put a geometric structure on uh, each of the surfaces. This is the famous Riemann uniformization theorem, uh, which was uh, uh, stated in terms of uh, complex analysis that uh, the, the cover of, the, of this Riemann surface um, uh, of the sphere is itself is the Riemann sphere of the torus is the complex plane uh, and uh, all the other surfaces is the is the uh, uh, open unit disk, which actually using the uh, using the Poincaré disk model is hyperbolic in terms of geometry. So these are spherical, Euclidean, and hyperbolic. So this is a geometrization theorem for surfaces. So now you can do something similar for three manifolds. That was the big work of uh, Thurston in the 1980s. And uh, there is three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So many similar things. You have a model, which means that you give a set of points. Then you give uh, straight lines, which are uh, uh, vertical lines, which are perpendicular to the xy plane. So the model is the upper half space. And, um, and uh, there are half circles, which are perpendicular to the xy plane. So similar things, but now you also have uh, planes like you have planes in R3. So hyperbolic uh, planes are again planes which are perpendicular to the XY plane or they are hemispheres uh, uh, whose center lies on the half hem so hemispheres whose centers are on the XY plane. There is one more object here uh, which is uh, what is called the, uh, called the horosphere. And this is a very interesting object in a speciality of hyperbolic plane and hyperbolic geometry is that this is actually a Euclidean object, which is sitting inside the induced metric is Euclidean. So this is a, like a Euclidean plane. Plane which is sitting inside here. So that's called the sphere at infinity. So that's that sphere at infinity over here. And you can compute the isometric group of it, which is Mobius transformations, also known as PSL2C. Um, and it acts as the Mobius transformations on the Riemann sphere, which is the complex plane, XY plane, using union infinity. And it extends uniquely to isometries on H3. So there's a lot of interaction for hyperbolic geometry in terms of surfaces, complex analysis, um, uh, and, and uh, three manifolds. So how do you make hyperbolic three manifolds? Well, how do you make Euclidean three manifolds? You take pieces uh, like actual triangles 
uh, Euclidean triangles and glue them together using Euclidean isometries. The same thing you can, same idea you can use to make hyperbolic three manifolds. You you take a polyhedra, hyperbolic polyhedra, and glue faces together. Now this this idea of the uh, uh, of the sphere at infinity. The sphere at infinity is just the x y plane here. So so that's that's the sphere at infinity right here union union infinity so uh, what happens is that uh, you have a geometric tetrahedra whose whose vertices are actually lie on the sphere at infinity so these are what are called ideal so ideal just means that uh, the vertices uh, are on uh, the sphere at infinity. And uh, because of the geometry, they have a finite volume. You cannot have this in Euclidean space. So this is what they look like because of the geometry. That's what they look like. These are going to infinity. The distance between these edges are going to is, is, is kind of going to zero. And so you can compute their volumes uh, very explicitly. Uh, so this is the ideal tetrahedron. This is the ideal octahedron and so on. This is my ideal dodecahedron. And what Thurston showed, one of the big theorems of Bill Thurston in the 80s was that most not complements are hyperbolic, meaning that they can be modeled on the three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. Uh, now, I, I just want to make a quick no technical note here. The not complement we saw was a compact manifold, but in order to be hyperbolic, we need to take uh, actually the, the, op the, the interior of this compact manifold. So just S3 minus K, not uh, S3 minus uh, a, a regular neighborhood and so on. And what Thurston proved that there are three kinds of knots. And now in S, uh, uh, yes, there are three kinds of knots. They're either the torus knots, which we saw yesterday, or the satellite knots, which we also saw yesterday. But if they're not torus or satellite, they're all hyperbolic. So hyperbolic knots are plenty. Now something special happens for alternating uh, knots. What Menasco proved right after Thurston's theorem was that if you have a prime alternating knot diagram, then you can tell whether it's hyperbolic or not right from the diagram. Because if it's not a torus alternating knot, then it is hyperbolic. And what's a torus alternating knot? Uh, it's of the form 2q, which is, this is your trefoil. So this is actually 2, 3, and then this is 2, 5, and then this is uh, 2, 7, and so on. So now if you look at the, 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 the table of knots, which was uh, uh, done by Tate, now you can right away see which are not hyperbolic. And this is incredible. You don't have to do any computation. Right from diagram and know that it is alternating, we can, we can tell whether they are hyper, hyperbolic or not. So for example, this is not hyperbolic. That's the unknot. It's a torus knot. 3-1 is also not hyperbolic. That's a torus knot. 5-1 is a torus knot. That is not hyperbolic. 7-1 is a torus knot. That's not hyperbolic. If you go around 9-1 is a torus knot. That's not hyperbolic. Uh, these are non-alternating knots. And in that non-alternating knots, of course, Thurston doesn't care. For Thurston, it is if it's not satellite, not torus, it's hyperbolic. 8-19 uh, is, hyper, is a torus knot. So that's not hyperbolic. Uh, but uh, it's 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 fairly easy to sh show that these are not satellites. So these are all hyperbolic knots. So that's really great. You have plenty of examples of hyperbolic knots. And so what do we do once we have geometry? We can find, you can measure, you can measure areas, you can measure volumes. And so one of the most important geometric invariant of a knot is the uh, hyperbolic volume of the knot complement if it's a hyperbolic knot. Now, if you think about volume, you can, you can just expand something and change its volume. So you may be wondering, wait a minute, how is that a invariant? Because I can take, a, take some square and I can keep expanding the square and I will keep getting different area. This is something which is very, very unique. 
for hyperbolic structures. That is that the hyperbolic structure is unique. This is a very, very deep theorem of master for the closed case and Prasad for the uh, for the for the non-compact case. So compact for master and non-compact for Prasad. So uh, this is called the master Prasad rigidity theorem. It says that hyperbolic structures are unique, which means that any geometric invariant is a topological invariant, which in turn uh, uh, it's a not invariant. So now we get a bunch of not invariants from geometry. So, so, and we can explicitly compute them. So, uh, if you if you now look at the knot, say figure eight knot, you can take the complement of it and you can build it out of hyperbolic pieces. So, well, the figure eight knot complement can be built out of two regular uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, ideal tetrahedra. The regular uh, corresponds to the shape of the ideal tetrahedra is a geometric object we know the volume of it so now we can we can compute the volume of the tetrahedra so we can compute the volume of the hyperbolic uh, figure eight knot yeah i should note that figure eight knot uh, this is of course hyperbolic and it is kind of the first knot which was uh, discovered to be hyperbolic so it has a special place and this is the Borromean rings, which is also hyperbolic, and it can be actually uh, made using two regular hyperbolic ideal uh, octahedra. And so we can actually compute the volume of it. In fact, you can compute the volume of pretty much any knot you can draw out. There is a very, very powerful program called SnapPy, which is based on uh, the original program called Snappy by Jeff Weeks, uh, which was extended into, into Python wrapper by uh, Mark Culler and Nathan Dunfield, and it computes uh, geometric invariance of knots. So you can, you can download it, you can draw a knot, and it will tell you if it's not hyperbolic. Otherwise, it will compute many, many um, uh, geometric invariants. Here I've shown some of cusp neighborhoods and volume and Dirichlet domains and covers and it checks isometry, it computes the number of tetrahedra uh, in the knot complement. So now, remember yesterday we were looking at crossing number, which is a measure of the diagrammatic complexity of knots, how complicated a diagram is. Now with uh, this geometry, uh, we actually get a measure, yes. Uh, Buddha Dev has raised his hand. Yes, yes I, I have a question actually. Uh, yes. How we detect a knot is torus knot? Uh, you can either see, change it into a torus knot diagram, or you can compute its fundamental group, or you okay. can compute its various invariants and see if the invariants are different from that of a torus knot. Uh, yeah. So uh, you are you are asking the the uh, question uh, is, uh, is uh, how do you check knot, knot equivalence? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, actually, uh, if we uh, want to know this knot is hyperbolic or not, so we delete the torus knot and satellite knot. So first we have to detect it is torus knot or not. Then we that's can right. detect. So that's right. That is, yes, that's you have to eliminate. You have to eliminate whether it is a torus knot. Uh, yes. And uh, if it is a satellite, that is correct. Yes. Yeah, and there, right. are, there are many ways to do it. How to how to check something is hyperbolic? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir. Thank you. So um, now we uh, so let's get back about to to the the uh, not tables generated by Tate and his collaborators. Uh, so they generated these tables based on a diagrammatic complexity, which is the crossing number. Uh, now with this perspective of hyperbolic geometry, we can define a geometric complexity, which is the minimum number of hyperbolic ideal tetrahedra, uh, which can be used to build the hyperbolic knot complement. So you start, then you can, similar to the uh, Tate's tables, we can now build a hyperbolic knot census. So Tate built a knot census based on crossing number. We can start doing this uh, using uh, hyperbolic geometry. So Callahan, Dean, and Week started this uh, project, and they uh, they constructed not uh, hyperbolic knots up to six tetrahedron. And then uh, myself and my collaborators we extended this to uh, seven tetrahedron and eight tetrahedron. These are what the numbers are there, and that many because there are many restrictions uh, of how to how to do this. Uh, the 
the the main challenge in this is to actually get the knot diagram once we actually figure out that this particular triangulation is a knot complement and it's hyperbolic then how to get the diagram so going from the triangulation to the diagram there are many ways to do it you look at various classes and families of knots and you search and see whether any of these not fit and eventually you exhaust and then you have to come up with some more innovative techniques to actually get the knot diagrams but so here are how some of these knots look and so these are pictures are generated by rob sharon using his uh, uh, knot plot program and uh, uh, these are some of the hyperbolic knots which we found and you can see some of them are of course this is the figure eight knot uh, this has two tetrahedra and then uh, the the numbers here uh, indicate um, indicate uh, the number of tetrahedra and then this is the number uh, in the in that particular census so k21 is the figure 8 knot this is the figure 8 this is the the first knot which can be made using three ideal tetrahedra so this is the fifth uh, this is the fourth knot which can be made using uh, five ideal tetrahedra so notice that some of them actually appear in the census of uh, uh, the 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 uh, Tate tables, but some of these look insanely complicated. Look at these knots, for example. This is coming from seven tetrahedral census. And uh, uh, these are some of the knots we found, and they look very complicated, but they are very geometrically simple. So the idea is that you look at the space of all knots, and if you put on your glasses, which detect diagrammatic complexity, you get this view of the simplest knots look like the Tate's tables. But now if you change your glasses and actually put on the geometric glasses, then you actually get a very different view of the knot complement, and that is very fascinating. So, um, all right, so these are, uh, the, the, there are many, many more things you can do uh, with hyperbolic knots, compute invariants, uh, try to relate uh, how the hyperbolic knots uh, and the geometric invariants relate to the topology, uh, relate to the geometry. Uh, and I'm going to uh, discuss two open problems in this, uh, in this, uh, area relating geometric uh, invariants to topological and other invariants. So the first is what is called the wall debt conjecture. So we saw what is the determinant and we saw what is the volume. So this is a topological um, invariant or also you can think of it as a diagrammatic invariant. It has many, many definitions. And uh, uh, this, is the, this is the hyperbolic volume and this is uh, uh, the, lo the logarithm of the determinant times pi and you can clearly see there this is indicating some some relationship uh, now the determinant also uh, is some kind of a volume but not really the geometric hyperbolic geometric volume which we are thinking of and so we conjectured recently about about uh, uh, six years ago that for any alternating hyperbolic knot the volume is less than two pi log of the determinant and this uh, uh, Conjecture, of course, we verified on the knot tables, which are now up to 16 crossing and more actually. Uh, but I think we verified it for about 16 crossings, which are about 1.7 million knots. Okay, so this is this is not a small number, uh, 1.7 million knots. We did it using computers, of course. Um, and and uh, uh, Burton uh, verified this conjecture for infinite families, what are called two bridge links and alternating three bridges. Um, what we proved when we conjectured is a very non-trivial theorem that this number two pi is sharp, which means that if you get any number smaller than two pi, then you can find a knot whose volume is greater than uh, that alpha times log debt. So what this means that if alpha is less than two pi, then there exists a hyperbolic knot or a link. Uh, th there exists K such that the volume of K is greater than alpha times the debt. So this is a two sharp, that's two pi is sharp. So that's one of the conjectures which relates volume and determinant. The second conjecture uh, is uh, relating quantum topology and, and uh, geometry. So uh, for that, I just need to set up a few definitions. So if you have a knot and let KR 
uh, denote the 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 cable R cable of a knot, but you need something called a zero framing. So let's not worry about the zero framing. Uh, so there is a zero frame R cable, and and it's very simple to construct. You start with a diagram, and you just you, you just take R parallel copies of it, except that. The, uh, to get the zero framing, you need to uh, twist it a bunch of times uh, uh, to get, so twist to get zero framing. So this is effectively uh, some kind of a cable which we saw a satellite of not. So it's like some kind of a cable with some, um, uh, some, some twist here. And now, um, we can we can define the colored Jones polynomial, which is a very popular quantum invariant. Uh, the coloring here uh, denotes the coloring of uh, the the knot by n-dimensional irreducible representation of the Lie algebra SL2C, and uh, it's defined using some quantum groups and so on. But there's a very nice and simple and accessible definition in terms of the scalings. So there is some normalization which uh, one has to be careful about. Um, so this colored Jones polynomial has this scaling formula, which means that if you take any uh, the colored Jones polynomial at the level n plus one, then you can write this as a sum of the uh, original Jones polynomial. This is your original Jones polynomial which we saw yesterday, but of the cablings with some weights. So so these are these are cablings. And and so once we have this colored Jones polynomial, we need to normalize it by the by the colored Jones polynomial of the unknot because if you do it like this, you see that the colored Jones polynomial of the unknot looks like this. This is this is called the quantum integer. So um, uh, so once you normalize it. Uh, the famous volume conjecture says that if you evaluate this normalized color Jones polynomial at nth normalized color Jones polynomial at the nth root of unity, take the absolute value and the, and take the log divide by n, it gives you the hyperbolic volume. It means that the growth rate, the growth rate um, of this quantity is uh, proportional to the hyperbolic volume. That's what it means. Uh, this is proposed by Kashaev uh, using the Kashaev invariant, and then it was um, uh, reinterpreted for the colored Jones polynomials by uh, Hitoshi Murakami and June Murakami. This is not a typo. There are two people involved which have the same last name. And uh, it's very difficult to prove the volume conjecture, mainly because uh, computing the colored Jones polynomial is very expensive computational time-wise. Uh, these cablings have lots and lots of crossings. You can see here, I haven't drawn the crossings, but right here, there are not, that we are looking at uh, uh, nine crossings here. Here. So, so we, are, we, are, we are looking at a lot of crossings. And so uh, we try to compute the Jones polynomial and uh, uh, we, we have to do many crossings. So you can see, uh, these are very long polynomials, and then uh, computing-wise, it's a little difficult. Uh, uh, you can, of course, use uh, uh, approximations, and it has been uh, verified computationally for many more knots, but proving that is a different ballgame. So, of course, it is proved for the figure eight knot. Everyone tries the figure eight knot first. So those are the those are the two. Um, uh, very, very interesting uh, open problems. Uh, note that the, they are relating on one side there is geometry, on the other side there is either one side on the geometry or topology, and on the other side there is either quantum topology or diagrammatic invariant and so on. So it's a, it's, it's a very nice sort of combination which is relating two different fields. And uh, in my few five, seven minutes remaining, let me uh, just go over two generalizations, uh, which are very recent and uh, which are really ex uh, uh, creating exciting uh, 
research areas. One is the idea of categorification. So uh, if you remember the Euler characteristic, which is V minus E plus F, uh, once you start learning algebraic topology and homology and so on, the first things you notice is actually the Euler characteristic is an alternating sum of uh, the rank of the homology groups. So what you are doing here is you are replacing something uh, which is uh, a, a number which has no invariance whatsoever. You can take any number of vertices, edges and faces and kind of uh, construct a surface to you are replacing that with some kind of invariant, right? So these are invariant things. So uh, this alternating sum gives you a number. Now you can just um, uh, upgrade this to one more variable by in introducing another grading. So if you look at a bi-grading, so if you look at bi-graded homology groups, which just means that there are there are grading i and j, and now you take a bi-graded Euler characteristic. What it means is on one grading, you take the regular Euler characteristic and the other grading you put in a variable, right? So this is your, your regular Euler characteristic on grading i. And then on the other grading, you put in a variable. So that gives you a polynomial, right? So every polynomial can be seen as a, as a bi-graded Euler characteristic of something. But the problem here is, suppose you are given a knot, you want to come up with not invariants, uh, bi-graded groups whose uh, bi-graded Euler characteristic gives you some polynomial not invariant. And so this was um, amazingly done uh, by both for Jones polynomial and Alexander polynomial. For Jones polynomial, it was done by Kavana around 2000, which is now called Kavana homology, whose bi-graded Euler characteristic is the Jones polynomial. And it was done by Ojwad Zabo and Rasmussen in 2005. Uh, using uh, Higart floor theory, which is now called knot floor homology. Again, bi-graded homology groups, which are invariants of knots, whose bi-graded Euler characteristic is the Alexander polynomial or the Jones polynomial. So this is a very, very active area of research, both Kavana homology and, uh, and Higart floor homology. The second uh, generalization I want to point out is uh, a, a generalization by Lou Kaufman uh, of virtual knots. So uh, what, what, what Lou Kaufman envisioned was that uh, as you draw knot diagrams, instead of an overcrossing and undercrossing, let us introduce a, a second type of crossing called a virtual crossing, which is, uh, which is uh, just uh, indicated by circling the vertex. In some sense, it is not really, uh, uh, it's not there in the plane. And so now, once you have a virtual crossing, you need to extend uh, your Rydermeister moves to include this virtual crossing. So these are extended Rydermeister moves. And now you can say that a virtual knot is an equivalence class, class of virtual knot diagrams, modulo, planar isotopy, and a finite number of classical Rydermeister moves and the extended Rydermeister moves. And so thus virtual knot theory was born. And a very nice, uh, topological point of view for virtual knot theory was given uh, later on by uh, Carter, Kamada, Saito, and Cooperberg. Um, this picture is from Kaufman. So he was envisioning this, this surfaces already that uh, this virtual crossing can be seen if you go over here as if you think about in the plane, everything, these crossings are in the plane, but when you come for a virtual crossing, you take a bridge. So you just go up uh, along, but this is going, going on a surface level. So uh, uh, if you think of this, uh, this means that this knot, virtual knot is actually embedded in a thickened surface. And uh, some kind of projection gives you this sort of virtual sort of virtualness. And uh, this is proved uh, rigorously uh, that um, virtual knots can be regarded as uh, just knots uh, simple cross code embedded in thickened surfaces. And uh, what about the thickened surface? There is some uniqueness to the thickened surface. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you think of your surface with smallest possible genus, then this embedding is unique up to isotopy, which means that uh, virtual knots, uh, uh, virtual knots are very, very related to 
uh, the study of knots in thickened surfaces. Knots in thickened surfaces. So, uh, well, that brings us to the end of my talk. Here are some very nice references. Uh, um, I really wish to promote uh, this wonderful book by my collaborator, Jessica Purcell, Hyperbolic Knot Theory. It is a new book, uh, and it really gives a very, very comprehensive introduction to uh, hyperbolic knots. And some of the uh, references which we had seen before, uh, some image credits, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Abhijit, for an uh, excellent talk, unraveling the theory of knots and uh, going up to open problems. I hope, uh, uh, I mean, the, the audience are at least excited about it. Let's hope somebody will take up studies in this direction. Any questions, comments? Uh, hello. Yes. So I have a question. So it's a, it's a not directly related to the talk, but with related to something not theory. So it's a basically there is a concept uh, uh, in Riemannian geometry called cut locus. So which says yes. that uh, till what point you can extend the geodesic failing to the distance minimality property. For example, in That's a right. sphere from North Pole to South Pole. So the South Pole is the is in the cut locus of the North Pole. So, yes. so we were trying to compute the cut locus of the some very basic knots, like say trefoil knot and all. And seeing that whether it can be well, uh, let me just stop you there. The trefoil yes. knot is a torus knot, it is not hyperbolic. So you cannot uh, do geometry on there. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Because we were thinking that whether after computation, it will, it, will it be served as a something not uh, invariant or something? Yes, yes, it will be. So you can do this on the figure eight knot. And uh, you're. I think what you're talking about uh, is very similar to the injectivity radius. Although uh, when you're looking at hyperbolic three manifolds, these are what are called cusped hyperbolic three manifolds. And so mm -hmm. at the cusp, uh, the cusps kind of, as you go out to infinity, they become smaller and smaller in size. So one has to be a little careful where you choose your base point and where you're looking at the cut locus. Uh, but these are, these are uh, related to injectivity radius problems. And there are, there are invariants of knots uh, called thickness and so on which you can, um, uh, or, or thickness or waist size of knots and so on, which are defined along these kind of lines. Is is basically what is the what is the radius of the biggest uh, uh, geodesic ball you can fit. But one has to be a little careful about the base points. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Buddhadev wants to ask. Yes, sir. I, I have a question. So my question is uh, uh, regarding Voldet conjecture. So uh, the Voldet conjecture is shown uh, in alternating some class of alternating norm regard uh, or equal to 16 crossing. So is there any uh, update uh, means is the update means is there any uh, theory for almost alternating not uh, for all are hyperbolic, almost alternating not for Voldet conjecture? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. I am okay. just trying to remember. Uh, there, there is some work on the Voldet conjecture by Colin Adams and his collaborators. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I, I would, I would uh, strongly suggest to check uh, uh, if there is any update for almost alternating knots, but not to my knowledge. The best of my knowledge, I do not know, but that's a very good question because um, uh, you would have to be a little careful extending the conjecture. The Voldet conjecture is only for alternating knots. 
you have to be a little careful extending the conjecture to almost alternating knots yeah yeah because uh, alternating knot have a knot diagram alternating they have some polyhedra decomposition but uh Maybe yeah, the polyhedral decomposition doesn't really get used in the walled conjecture okay, as okay, such. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That is a. Okay. Uh, the uh, but but uh, whether you can extend the conjecture to uh, the almost alternating knots is a very good question. I do not know what the answer is. I would like to know. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you for. <laughs> okay. Any other? Questions, comments? Hi, Abhijit. Hi, Ajit. Hi, sorry, I missed the uh, initial part of your lecture because I was in this uh, <coughs> another meeting. Anyway, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, see, now you have a reasonably good uh, software for classification and other things in the knot, right? Knots. Yeah, there's lots and lots of software. Uh -huh. for, so uh, I'm just, uh, not in uh, I'm just, yeah. just wondering. For example, initially those uh, so many uh, knots that were classified by dates. So initially, yeah. how did they manage to put uh, to <clears throat> identify them, and uh, what kind of input you put? Because knots could be really. Uh, well, are, very, you, very... are you men are you mentioning? Um, uh, how Tate did it, or your, no? Not your how team? Tate did it. He, once he did it, he did now, it by hand, right? Yeah. Now they yeah, had somebody. A, some somebody had to program it in order to understand yeah. the computers, all these knots, etc. Yes. So what kind of yes. input it, it goes in? Right. So so there are many different ways of inputting knots in this program. One is uh, simplest way is to actually draw the knot out. But that is uh, not really uh, uh, you 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 cannot you cannot run batches of stuff if you're drawing program. So the the way you draw uh, yeah, the one basically way you can access that to hmm. uh, to computer. They are using what is called a Docker code. So or, or a Docker Thistlewit code, which is a string of numbers. And there is a way to there is a there is a way from a knot diagram you get this Docker code. Which is just a string of numbers. It's actually a string of num even numbers up to two n if n is the crossing of the knot. And then um, you you can you can using the Docker code can construct a diagram. But for the for the computer, you can just store it as a Docker code. That is one way to do it. The second way to do it is use using braids. So which I did not get into, uh, but uh, but the but braid groups um, are a very very good way to represent uh, uh, knots, and you can you can encode that using braids. Uh, uh, but there are there are many many different ways of encoding knots on the computer. Another way to do it is again some kind of a code which was done by Gauss actually, and the Gauss code which just keeps a track of the double points on the circle because if you look at your graph. Uh, then it is a four valent graph. So if you if you think of it as a circle, then there are double points. So you just you just to, when you order the crossings, you just go around the circle and you have double points on it. And then you can add in signs according to what the crossings are. So um, you need just one bit at each crossing to determine whether it's an over crossing or under crossing. And uh, then using Gauss codes, in all of this, one has to be a little careful that when you go back and forth. Uh, once you have a Gauss code, when you go back, you may not get a knot, but you actually get a virtual knot. In fact, that was the motivation of how Kaufman, why Kaufman generalized knots to virtual knots, because every Gauss code has a virtual knot representative, but not every Gauss code may have a knot representative. So, so every Gauss code has a virtual knot representative. And so then you can just write down Gauss codes and then you can keep a track of how the Rydermaster moves go along and so on. But typically what it is, what is done is if you, if you input two knots, uh, the programs can go to compute various invariants by constructing various kind of diagrams. Another, another very uh, useful uh, uh, encoding is what is called PD code, which is a planar diagram code. So there are there are if, if you want I can send you some literature on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The, no, but the, I, not, I just, <clears throat> yeah. the notebook does 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 go about explaining some of that. I just wondering. See now days with so much of uh, let us say uh, thing is happening in machine learning, artificial intelligence. If somebody let us say you draw um, uh, some arbitrary knot, 
and uh, you just scan and put it uh, in this, we should be able to actually recognize what kind of knot it is. Yes. Uh, so, so um, yeah. So let me let me answer that. Uh, uh, give you two levels of answer. First is uh, using the various knot senses. Uh, the many of these programs can try to recognize knots if it's there in the senses. For example, Snappy, you can draw a knot and you can hit a browse knot button and it will tell you if it is if it is in the senses, it will identify it. Uh, the knot because it computes a bunch of invariances run, runs all kinds of searches and so that is one thing uh, the second uh, is uh, using artificial intelligence so there are now papers which are coming out which are using uh, this artificial intelligence uh, kind of machine learning kind of um, uh, techniques to address these problems in knots but that field is still young and i think um, um, I'm trying to remember. Well, very recently, Mark Lackenby and his uh, uh, and his collaborators wrote an article. Maybe it appeared in Nature, which did some very very beautiful work using machine learning. Mm -hmm. They predicted an invariant actually using the machine learning. Yeah, that's what so, I was wondering. No, because... so it was it was it is that's that's very sophisticated work, and I can send you. Be happy to send you some papers. But but other people have also done this kind of machine learning related things, and uh, uh, yeah, there is a lot of data, and one has to train, even has to, to train the machine to kind of see various patterns. And uh, yeah, I, I have I have many ideas in that with various questions which we which came up about you know 15 20 years ago when we were kind of looking at which is coefficients of Jones polynomial distributions of coefficients of Jones polynomials uh, what kind can occur and I think now with all the data we can try to uh, try to uh, uh, look at some of these questions. Yes. Yeah, that's what I think it could be very good. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, area one, of uh, yes one has to find the correct problem that mm. is not obvious no and, first, uh, first second, i think see first one has to create the model with where it will be able to rec recognize well, but, but even good, before uh, the model one has to one has to know what kind of problem one has to study and so uh, the, the the second thing is that after you create the model and even run it through the machine uh, we don't know if the machine will find something Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so it's a uh, it's definitely worth investigation, uh, but uh, it, 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 there there are a couple of subtle issues, uh, which which one has to. But yeah, one has to try. That's exactly okay. what it's all about. But yes, okay. there is a lot of data with all the computational stuff, and now there are beautiful techniques to understand um, uh, and deal with data. So that's certainly right. very nice question. Thank okay. you. Okay. Fine. More questions, comments? Um, yeah, uh, I had one question. Um, so, you know, like in the um, knot tables, I was just looking at the tables. And so some of the knots are, you know, much more symmetric, uh, like they have a nice uh, symmetry. Uh, is that captured by some invariant? Like, uh, I mean, how? If yeah, there are, there are, yes, uh, uh, that's a nice question about the symmetry of knots, um, uh, of knot diagrams. Yes, there are, there are invariants which behave in a certain way if you look at some cyclic covers, etc., on certain symmetric knots. And depending on what kind of symmetry you want, uh, many programs compute a symmetric group. So, for example, if you look at uh, Snappy and if you uh, draw a knot in there it will also compute the symmetry group of the knot uh, so you can actually get that uh, get get that group right away um, uh, and and uh, about the behavior of the invariants depending on the way the invariant is defined you may be able to see some um, some reflections of symmetry in the invariant but it really depends on um, on, on your point of view, because uh, the symmetry naturally kind of looks at a knot diagram and looks at the symmetry for knot diagram. But that symmetry may or may not be, um, uh, may or may not uh, go carry over in, say, a triangulation or something. 
so that's not uh, that's not clear and then there are triangulation symmetries which may or may not carry over in diagrams mm -hmm. so or, or the topology for that matter so one has to be a little careful but yes uh, uh, having some kind of obvious symmetries do get reflected in various polynomials and so on they make for wonderful pictures yeah, yeah, that's the more actually my point. <laughs> it would be good to, I mean, uh, you know, if we could discover some more, like, good, like, nice looking knots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and not the, the papers, not theory papers are filled with beautiful pictures. And you can see my talk, I have just, uh, I, I have drawn some of these pictures, but many of them are taken from various books and websites and so on. Thank you. And uh, thanks. And one more, one more question. Yes. In the uh, the uh, polynomials like the Kaufman, uh, the first one is the Jones polynomial. Other one. Yeah. In, it, bracket Kaufman, polynomial. Bracket. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, like, is it known like uh, like whether given a polynomial, whether we can we decide whether it's in whether it is a no. It, it is. It is. Uh, in general, it is not known. There are, of course, certain obstructions with using which you can rule out certain things. Um, uh, but uh, but that is the realization problem. And it is it is not known. For Alexander polynomial, it was solved. That was one of the big successes uh -huh. of science approach. That uh, the Alexander polynomial uh, satisfies some properties. And uh, if a polynomial satisfies those properties, then uh, you can construct a knot uh, whose Alexander polynomial is that yeah. polynomial. So yeah. um, that is the realization problem. And uh, uh, the realization problem for, uh, uh, for, for Jones polynomial, all of these questions for the Jones polynomial, the unknotting prop detection, realization, the genus uh, 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 the detection, all of that is widely open for the Jones polynomial. It's, it's not known how they how they correspond. I see. But for the Alexander polynomial, it's uh... Alexander polynomial is because of the Seifert's construction goes right from diagrams and surfaces, and one can it's very very intrinsically related to the topology and the combinatorics. Not Alexander's definition. Alexander's definition is a little inaccessible. Uh, but uh, but Seifert's definition uh, and, and and the idea which I did not get to is once you have a Seifert surface which is an orientable surface you can cut the knot complement along the Seifert surface meaning that you take a th the you take s cross i and then you take the take the knot complement and uh, cut it along this thickened surface and now using that. Uh, you get a manifold with which has two boundary components which are copies of the surfaces but they are somehow kind of uh, intermingled together and using this you can construct the infinite cyclic cover and that is Seifert's proof that the Seifert matrix uh, helps you want to get Alexander's polynomial it's a construction of the infinite cyclic cover by cutting across the Seifert surface so you have a lot of control over what can happen uh, along the diagrams, along the topology, and so on. Okay, okay. And and like the cyclic cover translates into the polynomial. Like the infinite cyclic cover. Then you can compute the model structure. Uh -huh. So so you can compute the, the the you can compute the action of the of the homology the the T uh, on the infinite cyclic cover, and you can see how the, it's it's a simple action. It just takes you take z copies of of this manifold. And you are gluing your your positive copy to the negative copy, and your action of the homology just just shifts it over. Mm -hmm. So then, hence the 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 presentation matrix is exactly encoded by the by the by how the plus and minus surfaces interact. That's exactly mm -hmm. the ciphered form. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the once you see the picture, the the proof is actually not difficult. I see. So this is a classical work like of it's classical work yeah yeah mm -hmm. any any book on knots should have it okay 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 thanks a lot thank uh, more questions krishna is here hi krishna
Hi, Jansen. So I am hi, happy hi. to see you all the time. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Krishnendu. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Good to see you too. Yeah, How yeah. are so you? I see lots of good friends here. Yeah, I am <laughs> fine. How are, I, I actually, Shomaya told me that uh, you were asking about me. So I thought, <laughs> let me drop in and say oh, hi to you. Oh, so so, <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. I, But I did not I know that there are you. other old friends also. Like, Jayanthan is here. I mean, I didn't... <laughs> I know that Jayanthan is one of the key architects of this uh, initiative, yeah. Yes, so some recently, and others are doing... Someone was asking me about... Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, yeah, Abhijit, go ahead. No, you had a question. No, no, I, I don't have a question. You go ahead. Tell me. Yeah, I, I was just saying, Samme is doing such a great job organizing this... forum and uh, we are getting all these people involved really nice oh yes 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 yeah. so he is involved in lots of outreach activities which is good for mathematics i think exactly yeah, yeah. fantastic yeah very nice so uh, i do i i would like to chat but we are still kind of streaming online so i'm <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when are you planning to visit India? No idea, right? Because of pandemic, or you we plan, are leaving. Uh, we are streaming online. I don't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can stop streaming, no? Stop the recording, yeah. no? If there are more, we'll no more have, questions. Uh, yeah. If there are questions, yeah. 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 Okay, I can... think that let them do the formality. That I think they want. That's right. Finish yeah. some formality. Yeah. yeah. Just, just, just hang around for a few minutes. Just, just yeah, hang yeah. around for the first, sure, sure. and we can chat more. Sure, sure. Shamik, you, you also please uh, hang around for a few minutes after this gets over. Yeah. Okay, so I think the organizers can take over and uh, yeah, Chaitanya. Conclude the session. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jayanthan as well as Professor Abhijit for uh, such an amazing event. Now. I would like to invite Professor Samyade for a vote of thanks. I'm not here yet. I do it. So, uh, on behalf of Curry Leaf, I would like to thank Professor Abhijit Champanerkar for accepting our invitation and delivering the two wonderful talks on uh, four different perspectives of uh, on uh, of knot theory. he actually started from the very basic definitions of the subject and proceeded to showing us the state of the art of currently ongoing research in the field including several open problems <clears throat> thanks a lot sir for providing us your valuable time we would like to thank professor ajit kumar and professor av jansen for accepting our invitation and chairing the two talks thank you uh, for your help and support <clears throat> from the very inception karilif has been running with support from mtts trust we would like to thank the mtts trust for extending every possible support to karilif uh, and its activities and finally we would like to thank all the participants for their active participation in the event and we hope to see all of you in our upcoming events too uh, let us have a group photo yes chaitanya can we do it Uh, so i would request sure. everyone to please uh, if possible open your videos so that we can have a, a group photo session we'll wait for one minute so that everyone can open their videos i think the host has disabled it uh no yeah. Uh, you can try. Okay, let me do it from my end. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Is it fine? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Ready? Three, two, one. Smile. Okay. Done. Yeah. All right. Thank you. and also there is a link in the chat uh, uh, to join our mailing list so i request everyone to join our mailing list so that you receive our email yeah 
I think over to Chetan and Nandana to finish. With this, our two-day event with Professor Abhijit Champanerkar comes to an end. We again thank, uh, sincerely thank you and uh, hoping to see you soon in future Karelief events. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much to all the organizers for their really very smooth and professional organizing at every step. Uh, I'm really very impressed and uh, I applaud you for your a uh, good effort in bringing uh, very good mathematics to a lot of students. And I saw your audience was also very interactive. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I, I will, I, I, I'm sure you will get a lot of support from the mathematical community for uh, what, what you have started. And I also would like to thank my dear friends, Ajit and Jayantan for the generous introductions and for sharing the sessions. And I thank all the participants for your interest in this field, uh, for attending the talks uh, and your wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Okay, let me also take this opportunity on behalf of MTTS Trust to thank this curry leaf. They are really doing amazing job. And uh, of course, thanks to Abhijit for delivering is a very nice uh, introduction to, to North Theory. So thank you all. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Karilif for uh, uh, you know, inviting me to this platform. It was uh, very nice, uh, particularly, you know, chair uh, one of my best friends <laughs> talks. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I am sure I'm, uh, my support, whatever format I, I, I offer you uh, for the future activities as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, sir. <laughs>